morning is Francisca Porkert, and she will talk about the five mass kite integral family. Uh, thank you. So first, I want to thank the organizers for the nice conference and for inviting me to speak here. Um, and I'm very happy to talk about work together with Mathieu Giraud, André Pokraka and Johan Sonle on the five mass um, kite integral family of uh, state energy farm and diagrams. And the talk is based mostly on the paper given here, as well as some work in progress. So, sorry about that. Should work. Okay. Um, to motivate this, let's first consider a self energy or two point diagrams in scalar QFT. At one loop, computing the most generic of these is simple. It's just a one mass bubble, a two mass bubble that you even encounter in your first QFT class. And at two loop, things get more complicated. For example, in the electron self energy, the massive elliptic sunrise integral appears. And um, this was only solved in 2019 for the unequal mass case. And it contains uh, five reducible scalar products, but only three propagators. So it's only the um, subtopology of a larger diagram with five propagators, which is called the kite diagram. And this is then the most generic um, two loop two point uh, graph one can construct in a scalar QFT. And by solving it, we effectively obtain all um, scalar two loop two point uh, integrals. And uh, solving this is uh, even more complicated because it contains even more elliptics than the um, sunrise integral. And that brings me to the second part of my motivation. So the second uh, reason why considering this kite integral family is interesting is because of the technical challenges involved in it. As we've heard from Lorenzo on, on Monday, the appearance of tori or even, even higher um, dimensional or um, geometries with higher chinos is, uh, happens very often in higher orders of perturbative quantum field theory. And understanding these geometries better is really helpful in computing multi-loop Feynman integrals analytically. But only a few results have been obtained for cases with multiple tori or many kinematic parameters on the tori. And here the kite integral family has um, five kinematic parameter and is related to two tori. So in this talk, you will see how parameterizing um, all of these five kinematic parameters on the two tori um, will help us to obtain a solution as it allows us to use the properties of these geometries. And we assume that these ideas might also be applicable to other uh, cases with multiple geometries or many parameters. Um, okay, but uh, before we get there, let me first introduce the kite integral family in more detail. So it's defined by this um, scalar diagram where every propagator has a generic mass. And we denote the propagators by the numbers of the masses, which also appear in the integral representation that is given above. And we want to solve this in two minus two epsilon Euclidean dimensions. So to see the emergence of the two elliptic curves, um, note that there are two sunrise subtopologies in this um, cut integral family. Um, so one has uh, propagators one to three, uh, where the, the labels again denote the masses that appear, and the other one has propagators three, four, five. And uh, the massive sunrise integral is um, related to an elliptic curve, which is isomorphic to a torus. So through these two distinct sunrise subtopologies, we obtain two elliptic curves related to this kite integral. And um, the kite integral was in fact solved analytically for the case where two masses vanish, so that it's only related to one of the tori, but never in full generality with both of these um, tori present. And um, overall, if we um, put this integral family into an IBP reducer, we obtain 30 master integrals, and these can be classified by the elliptic curves that appear. So in the top sector, we have only one integral, and this is also the only one related to both of the um, elliptic curves, and it's just the kite with all propagator weights set to one. Then um, for, for one elliptic curve, we obtain four um, additional um, subtopologies that we denote the eyeballs, and each of these has four propagators, and one of them is always the middle line. So each of them is associated to one of the sunrises. For example, this one, two, three, four eyeball has propagators with masses M1, M2, and M3. So it has the one, two, three sunrise as its subtopology and is related to its torus. But um, since it doesn't have mass five, it's not related to the other torus. Then we have, of course, the two sunrises and their dotted versions. And the rest of the basis is filled with elliptic, uh, non elliptic um, master integrals. And these four eyeball subtopologies will be very helpful in, in solving the integral family as they allow us to work on only one torus but still contain a lot of the kinematic structure. Okay, and as was just reviewed in the, in the previous talk, 
a standard method to compute such an integral family is the method of differential equations. So we set up a differential equation with respect to the kinematic parameters, which for us are the five masses of the cut integral family and the um, external momentum, and we um, use their scalars ratios that we denote by xi. Then to solve this um, systematically in terms of iterated integrals, we find a transformation to an epsilon form differential equation, and then um, this um, new basis can be solved as a path ordered exponential over the, um, of an integral over the matrix D, um, where we um, multiply with the boundary um, constant to account for the lower boundary. And then we obtain our result expanded in epsilon with iterated integrals over B. And in the main part of the talk, I will explain how we solved this um, integral family and uh, highlight uh, how we dealt with the two tori and the many parameters. So um, the parameterization of these parameters on the two tori is uh, an essential step for the solution. So this will be the first uh, part of my talk. Um, then in the next part, I will explain how we use this parameterization to find the epsilon form differential equation and finally comment a bit on um, the iterated integrals that appear in the solution and what they tell us about the singularity structure. So um, to set up the parameterization on, for the full kite, uh, I want to first uh, talk about how the uh, sunrise um, is parameterized on its torus. And um, so to, to see where the elliptic curves comes from, you compute the maximal cut of the sunrise integral. So you uh, use Bykov representation and then um, replace the propagators by delta functions and you end up with an integral which has a quartic in the denominator whose zeros are rational functions in the kinematics. And this quartic then defines your elliptic curve with coordinates y and x. And uh, it is characterized by these branch points ei that are characterized by your kinematics. And this elliptic curve is isomorphic to a torus. So through its maximal cut, you obtain a torus for the massive sunrise. So um, next, we need to understand which um, parameters naturally arise on this torus for our kinematic space. So first, the two periods of the elliptic curve can be computed by integrating over the holomorphic differential dx over y along the two cycles. Um, these integrals generally evaluate to elliptic integrals um, of the first kind as defined here, and um, their argument is also a ratio of the ei, so a function of the kinematics. And then we generally work with a normalized version, which we denote by tau. Um, and this tau can then be taken as the first parameter for the kinematic space of the sunrise. And for the remaining two parameters, we need to choose points on this torus. And these points on the torus can be obtained from points on the elliptic curve via Abel's map, which is also an integral over the um, holomorphic differential and generally evaluates to ratios of elliptic integrals where the elliptic integral of the first kind, um, which is incomplete, is defined here. And um, for the massive sunrise, uh, Bogner, Müllerstach, and Weinziel found three punctures of this form, which all share the modulus k squared and are distinguished by their um, parameter ui. And only two of them are independent. So these two are the two um, remaining kinematic parameters for the sunrise. Which means that now for our two sunrise subtopologies, which we um, again denote by the masses that appear, um, we can parameterize each of them on its torus by the period and two special punctures. Uh, so overall, at this point, we have six kinematic parameters. Um, but despite the kite integral family having only five parameters, we find that these are not um, sufficient to parameterize it sensibly. That is because we have subtopologies such as the eyeballs that have more than these three parameters, but are naturally related to only one of the tori. So parameterizing them partially on one and partially on the other would uh, make the solution more complicated. So what we want to do is we want to find um, all kinematic parameters on each of the tori. And for that, we need to find additional punctures on each torus. And uh, we do so first for the eyeball subtopologies. So uh, we take as an example this 1, 2, 3, 4 eyeball, which has masses uh, m1, m2, m3, and m4, and the external momentum, so four parameters. And it's only related to the 1, 2, 3 torus. Um, that means we can reuse our sunrise parameters tau z1 and z2, and we need to find one additional parameter z4. And uh, what we found is that such a new parameter can be obtained um, systematically by integrating over the maximal cut in two dimensions. So specifically for the 
one, two, three, four eyeball, the maximal cut is a simple function with a square root of two shell n functions in the denominator. And we integrated over x4, which is the parameter that did not appear in the one, two, three torus, and uh, obtain this result, um, which contains a ratio of elliptic integrals. And we had already encountered these. These are uh, characteristic for being a puncture on a torus. So we choose um, this ratio as our new puncture, which has again the modulus of the um, sunrise and a new kinematic function u4. And that this is a good choice will be visible later when um, we see that the differential equation and the result take a um, simple form in this um, parameter, but uh, we can already argue it for it now. So um, if we consider its limits, we can also recover the sunrise puncture. So if we take the limit and four square to infinity on this new function u4, we get back the function u2 that defined our um, second sunrise parameter. And the sunrise punctures themselves are related by an exchange of the masses m1 and m2. So um, we also recover um, the punctures at one. So um, what we found is that all parameters that are necessary to parameterize this one, two, three, four eyeball subtopology can be obtained from simple integrals over the maximal cut and limits. And um, for the full kinematic space of the kite, so not only this one subtopology, um, the symmetry of the kite integral family is useful. So in addition to this one, two, three, four eyeball, we also have an eyeball which has a mass M5, and this can be parameterized in the same way, um, where we obtain a new puncture set five by integrating over the maximal cut, and then we can combine the known sunrise parameters, the two new punctures and the period, and obtain all of our five um, kinematic parameters. Um, okay, and uh, to obtain the parameterization for the second torus, we can just play the same game again. So there are two eyeballs related to the second torus. We just integrate over their maximal cuts and then obtain the two new punctures, the two sunrise punctures and the period. And then we also have the kinematic space on the second torus. Um, so we found that we can actually really obtain all the parameters that we need from these simple integrals over the maximal cut. And um, now we have everything that we need for our epsilon form differential equation. So um, we want to find uh, a transformation of our initial differential equation, the ISA i, to a new basis in epsilon form. And the initial differential equation structure looks like this. So in the upper left corner, we have the two sunrise sectors. Each of them has elliptic entries in the top sector and some uh, d logs that are black here. Then we have all of the non-elliptic subtopologies, which are yeah, all only have d logs. And the interesting part are these six lines, where we first have four lines of the two eyeballs. And um, since each of them is related to only one of the sunrises, they also only have entries in one of the sunrise columns. And the only, en uh, only line that has actually entries in both of the sunrise columns is this um, kite line itself. Okay, so we will bring this in epsilon form, sector by sector, starting from this upper left corner. And here the first three steps are simple. So as a first step, we can just use a known result and bring this sunrise sector in epsilon form with a transformation by Bogner, Müller, Stach, and Weinziel. And this for the first time introduces elliptic objects into our bases, such as the periods and their derivatives. Then um, we use standard methods for the non-elliptic uh, entries. So we have the diagonal, which we bring in epsilon form by normalizing with leading singularities, or in our case, just dividing by the maximal cut in two dimensions. And then the only um, non-elliptic terms that are not in epsilon form are located here, and that these can also be brought in epsilon form with a simple transformation. So um, after these three steps, we have a new differential equation with a matrix B2 which has only non-epsilon form terms in these entries, so the elliptic entries related to the eyeballs and the kite. And we first bring the um, eyeball sectors in sunrise, uh, uh, the eyeball sectors in epsilon form. And um, here um, the, the eyeball sunrise entries are what we, what we need to transform. So um, since uh, the matrix is very symmetric, we can only consider one entry as an example. And here we again choose an entry related to this one, two, three, four eyeball. And this is entry 259 uh, located in the matrix here. And we make an ansatz for the next transformation U3 and require that the, um, the differential equation will be in epsilon form in this entry after the transformation. 
And this requirement uh, leads to a differential equation that can be read off directly from here and will give us our, um, the parameter that we've been looking for in our ansatz. And it can be solved by a simple integral over x4. And this integral, if you uh, just put it in Mathematica, it's simple enough that uh, you can um, evaluate analytically. And it contains, um, again, these ratios of elliptic integrals, which we had seen before. So we, again, um, obtain the punctures that we had found by integrating over the maximal cut. And since we have four entries of this kind, so two here and two here, we also uh, recover all of our punctures. So they are also natural objects that appear in our um, epsilon form differential equation. And we now need this puncture for our final transformation to epsilon form, which contains, uh, yes, um, which, um, which uh, concerns only the um, kite sunrise entries. And again, we make an ansatz for the next transformation U4 with only one non-trivial entry V, which is in this entry 39, and require that this entry will be in epsilon form after the transformation. And again, this leads to a differential equation, which now takes the form minus B tilde is dV, where B tilde is an entry of the differential equation, um, B2, and uh, V is this entry of U4 that we're looking for. And this time the integral is not, um, the differential equation is not simple enough that you can just um, integrate it in Mathematica, and we needed a different approach. And for this, we could use the connection to the tori. So we saw that B tilde can be split into a part proportional to the period, and a part proportional to its derivative, where the um, coefficients are just functions in the kinematics. And then one can compute a modular transformation of B tilde and sees that B tilde transforms like the derivative of a quasi-modular form of weight one. So we can um, assume that V must also transform as a quasi-modular form of weight one and transform the whole differential equation for V. That way we obtain our new differential equation for V, which has one part that is trivial, because it's just proportional to the previous one, and uh, a second part, which can then be simply solved, and we find that V is minus psi one times d tau times rho in the direction of d tau. And rho, as I just said, is initially given in the kinematic parameters. So to find its d tau direction, we need to um, transform it to the torus, which in this case is the one, two, three torus. And this is done by computing the inverse of the Jacobian, um, which means that we actually need all of the parameters, so all of the punctures that we had found before. And uh, what you should take away from this uh, rather technical slide is that um, working on the tori and really understanding the modular transformation behavior of an entry can help you to find a simple transformation to an epsilon form, but this really requires a good understanding of the um, parametrization and um, all punctures on the torus that um, appear in this entry. Okay, with this last transformation, we have found our epsilon form differential equation, which we can now solve in iterated integrals on the tori. Um, and these are the iterated integrals over B. And initially, our new differential equation matrix B will be given as a complicated function in the kinematic parameters and the elliptic objects that we had introduced. So to express um, B in a simpler form and finally also obtain our result in known functions. We want to um, parameterize it on the torus and express it in the G kernels, which are the natural integration kernels on the torus. And they are um, defined as the coefficients of the Kronecker-Eisenstein series and can be combined to these Kronecker forms. And uh, we know that these Kronecker forms transform as quasi-modular forms of weight k minus two and the Gs diverge um, when set vanishes. So this will also tell us something about the singularities. And if we then integrate these Kronecker forms along Z, we obtain elliptic multiple polylogarithms, so we can express our result in well-known functions. But what we need to do for this is to reorganize our differential equation B in terms of this Kronecker form, and for the d tau parts, we will also require some um, forms uh, defined with Eisenstein series that do not depend on the um, parameters Z. And practically, this is done by first determining which Kronecker forms appear in a given entry, and then determining their um, linear conversion numerically. Um, and in the set parts, we only need the Kronecker forms, and in the end, we need to fix some remaining tau parts with the forms eta two and eta four. Okay, so the important part here is to decide which Kronecker forms appear. Um, the Kronecker forms are only defined with respect to one of the tori. Um, so for every entry, we need to decide first which, um, which torus to work on. 
And this is simple if you look at uh, the differential equation. So any entry related to one of the tori, so the blue and orange entries here, must be parameterized on a torus. And the uh, um, remaining black D log entries can be parameterized on either torus. Uh, then to determine which omega k exactly to put into your ansatz for a given entry, you determine the modular transformation behavior of this entry. So for example, if your entry transforms as a quasi-modular form of weight zero, you can only put in omega twos. And um, the arguments are a function of the puncture set and a um, function of the tau. And for us, only um, C tau with C is one or two up here. And uh, the important part here are these linear combinations of the set. Um, and we uh, found that these can be obtained from a Q expansion where Q is e to the i pi tau. And I will discuss this more on the next slide, but I just wanted to comment here also that um, whilst this is a mostly a formal matter to transform this to the omega case and to express an MPS, these LI of set will also tell us something about the singularity structure because uh, the Gs appearing in this omega chronicler when, uh, diverge when LI of set vanishes. So their zero loci will be um, singularities of our integral. Okay, so um, all of these LI of set can be obtained just from the diagonal. And for this, uh, note that any diagonal entry uh, is a linear combination of D logs. And these D logs must be expressible in omega twos. And the Q expansion of these omega twos has a leading order term, which is a D log of sine of its argument. So if you, on the other hand, also Q expand the uh, kinematic arguments of the D logs that appear, we can basically read off our appearing ally of set by comparing the leading order. And in that way, we obtained um, 17 of these linear combinations on each of the tori, and they take a very simple form. So these are the um, most non-trivial we obtain, and this again is an argument for our choice of good punctures because we obtain very simple arguments. And yeah, with these we also obtain some of the singularities. Um, okay, so the final step uh, to find the solution is to determine the boundary condition. Uh, so as a boundary point, we chose all masses to be equal and larger than zero, and the momentum to uh, go to zero. And in that limit, our uh, initial vector takes a simple form where the only appearing integrals are a bubble and a triangle that can be just computed with Feynman parametrization. And with this boundary point and our differential equation, we checked that um, our result matched with uh, numerical integration. And um, one last comment on the um, result in iterated integrals. So we also found that we can express this in EMPS. And what's important to note on the result is that um, at um, every order on epsilon, we obtain iterated integrals that are refined only with respect to one of the tori. So we only obtain um, integrals over omega one, two, three, or omega three, four, five, but no terms which have both tori appearing. And that is also because of the structure of the matrix. So uh, no matter which order, you will never have a mixing of terms um, related to both of the sunrises, so of these blue and orange terms, um, only with like blue with blue and orange with orange, or like either of them with uh, the black D logs. And since you can parameterize the D logs on either toros, you can choose your parameterization in a way that you never obtain this mixing of, um, of tori. Okay, this is then uh, the final result. And um, I want to summarize what we did. So the important step for us in the beginning was the parameterization of the kinematic space on both tori. And we did so by finding our punctures from integrals over the maximal cuts of subtopologies. Um, then we used these um, punctures to find, a, uh, to find an epsilon form differential equation where the understanding the modular transformation behavior of the entries was very useful. And finally, we expressed our result in iterated integrals on the tori by using the Q expansion to find the arguments of the Kronecker forms, which were also singularities of our integral. And um, now it would be interesting to see whether these ideas are also applicable for other multi-scale Feynman integrals with several elliptic curves, um, like the um, elliptic double box with many parameters. And something else that would be uh, um, interesting would be to uh, um, look at more efficient numerics for the final, final result in the MPLs. And of course, one could also go beyond these tori and look at Calabiaus and hyperelliptic um, curves instead of elliptic curves. Uh, thank you for your attention.
thank you for this great presentation and we have time for questions. Here. Uh, thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I'm very interested in the observation that uh, the two, uh, the, the, the symbol letters relating to the two Taurus never met, uh, never, never mixed. And uh, I, I'm just wondering, like, so, so, so looking at this expression, it seems that we can uh, separate this integral into a sum of two parts where each depending on only one torus. I mean, does it make sense to define such an object and maybe like interpret it in terms of some Feynman integrals or? So, I mean, that the splitting is just really a um, result of how the uh, two elliptics curves appear because they appear really in two separated um, subtopologies. Uh, but you mean whether you could define like two separate parts or? Well, I, I, I mean, just just the the top sector mm -hmm. integral. I mean, you're just you're. Are you claiming that it equals a sum of two things where each one depending on only one of the torus? Yes, um, but. Um, I think this is because you mentioned the top sector. The top sector itself is not uh, elliptic, only the subtopologies. That is why you can do this. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, I see. So if you so... had an elliptic curve in the top sector and different ones in the subtopologies, then it would not be that clear anymore. And it's also why it would be interesting to look at another example where this happens and you could see what, what happens then. Oh, I see. Great. Thanks. <laughs> More questions? <laughs> 